Well, Fesker Maa Huladunyas Falchi, good afternoon everyone and welcome. This is the uh, fifth meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing in uh, 2018. We have no apologies. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private, um, which is about the subcommittee's work programme. Are we all agreed? agreed. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Uh, agenda item two is Police Scotland's custody provision. And it's an evidence session on that. And I refer members to paper one, which is a note from the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. And I'd like to welcome Chief Superintendent Gary McEwen, the Criminal Justice Services Division of Police Scotland. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> Callum Steele, the General Secretary of the Scottish Police Federation. And Lucille Ingalls, Chair of the Police Staff Scotland branch of Unison Scotland. Thank you. You're all very welcome. And I'll move straight to questions. And Margaret, you have the first question. Good afternoon, everyone. Can I thank you for your written submissions? But looking at these written submissions, there's quite a vari variation in the estimate of the, the number of vacancies within the custody division. So could I have the assessment from each of you as to how many you think it actually is? Uh, thanks, convener. Um, I, I think, in, in fairness, the the assessment is different depending on your starting point and how you measure it. Um, certainly, as of the 5th of March, when I replied to the convener of the committee by correspondence, the position was exactly as we understood it, as was as laid out in, in correspondence. Um, of course, if the, uh, if the starting point for uh, the basis of counting is assumed to be different across the three representatives that are before you just now, you're always going to get a different answer. So, uh, other than what I have laid out in the correspondence that I uh, provided to the Convener on the 5th of, uh, 5th of March, that's as the Scottish Police Federation understands it. And would you, just for the record, say how many that is? Yeah, it's, it was certainly more than uh, more than the 18 that uh, that was cited. Um, if you uh, uh, appreciate that, that you'll take a direction from the Convener, but if you allow me to remind myself through the correspondence that I have here, I'll oh, come back okay. to you with that. I think it may have been 45. It might be more. Yeah. Okay. Yes? Yes, 45. 45, thank you. And the others? Unfortunately, I don't have an overall total. Um, I'm deputising for Michelle McHardy. However, I would say that most places are down by one or two in the smaller areas, um, but there is a lot of vacancies, certainly. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't have a, a number, really, that um, you could... No, I'm quantify. sorry, I wouldn't know. But I can certainly get you. Yeah. And Mr McEwen? So uh, I'm quite clear on the, the numbers. And it is, Callum's right, it's a moment in time. So uh, pre-April 2000, or post-April 2017, at the, the time of submission, which was, I think, January or February 18, there was 18 vacancies. Those 18 vacancies, 12 of them have now been filled six are still in the process of under recruitment and there's an additional two vacancies on top of that with people retiring so we now have eight <coughs> vacancies at this present time uh, across my custody and criminal justice division prior to april 2017 there was a through vacancy management the force took the decision to delete a number of posts across the whole of the organization that had previously been vacant for a period of time and the posts that were deleted from my division at that time was 50. So how many should there be in total? Uh, there, there should or should not, there is not a definitive number about what there should be because we're forever trying to improve and rationalise our estate. So as it stands right here, right now, there is eight vacancies. And how many roughly do you have then? <coughs> Sorry, hundreds. Hundreds. Hundreds of staff, yeah. Um, there's a submission within the SPF that understand that 118 PCO vacancies across the country have simply been deleted. Would you like to comment on that? And that's the point that I was trying to make earlier, is that pre-April 2017, there was 50 posts deleted through vacancy management because the posts had been vacant for a period of time, but that was April 2017, so in excess of a year ago. That seems an awful lot, 118. Why would that be? It wasn't 118, it was 50. So would that be your assessment then, Mr Steele? Uh, again, uh, through yourself, Convener, the, the position as, uh, as articulated in the correspondence was, as we understood it at that moment in time, I mean, I, I appreciate Mr McEwen's careful use of language in calling it vacancy management. Uh, the, you know, this, this comes down to the fact that the reason the posts were left vacant is because there wasn't the money to fill them. Um, now, 
that is, I, th I think, probably the fundamental problem is, is that uh, those that are working in the criminal justice area, particularly in custody, and indeed across uh, all areas of the service, are under phenomenal pressure and are working exceptionally hard. Uh, and I wouldn't expect anyone of Mr McEwen's seniority to come to the uh, Justice Committee and say that the police service is underfunding any particular part of it. But vacancy management is another word for there wasn't the money to recruit the people that were required to undertake the job, which I'm sure uh, Lucille, uh, to my right, would be able to confirm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Could I um, perhaps, I, mean, I think it's quite concerning that we have this kind of variation. Could you outline the process then for calculating um, the, the um, custody vacancies? Because I think you said, um, Mr Steele, that it varies, depends how you do it. So what is the official process, perhaps, Mr McEwen? So, so from April 2017, so over a year ago now, the, the force executive took the decision that any posts or any individuals that left my, my division from that point onwards would be backfilled. We would recruit externally. So that is what we have been doing. So I'm working from a, a position that's been well established now for in excess of a year. Uh, and as I said earlier, in the, the January or February submission, we had 18 vacancies, but a fair proportion of them have now been filled, and we are now working towards filling the remainder. So if 60 police officers are backfilling, is that really a temporary solution, and these are equivalent to 60 vacancies in reality? It's, it is a temporary solution, so agreement was reached. So again, about, as I described at the last occasion I was here, is that what what happened previously, now I'm going back since Police Scotland came into existence, was there was a mon monitorium on recruitment of PCSOs because they were going to be embarking upon a period of organisational change. So as someone left the organisation between 2013 up until April 2017, there was a monitorium on recruitment. What we found, and certainly Eunice and colleagues uh, were, were the first to, to voice their concerns, is that the backfilling arrangements were very high risk because one day, as I think I described the last time, Mr Finney might come in and be the, the police officer. The next time it might be Mr McPherson, then Mr MacArthur. So there was no real continuity. And what we found was that the, the, the police staff experts were regularly having to rebrief verbally and advise the cops that were coming in of changes in practice. So what we took, or the executive took the decision in November of last year was let's move 62 police officers into the structure to enable us to uh, move towards full organisational change. And what that permanent 62 officers would provide is that continuity rather than a disparate approach. And, and certainly I have seen, and certainly my staff, and we'll see what the, my colleagues say, but the, 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 the professional continuity has certainly been increased as a consequence of that. Can I just say, though, with this, your submissions, what we've heard today, this is really as clear as mud. To say that it lacks transparency is an understatement. So can I suggest that um, as a result of this meeting, then you take back these comments to Police Scotland and see if we can get a definitive way of establishing what's the optimum number that would be ideal within certain boundaries, uh, how many we actually have, how it's calculated, and the effect of, of backfilling, which is something that we've looked at since the inception of Police Scotland as being detrimental to the delivery of the service. But perhaps you can elaborate on how backfilling and these 60 officers doing the backfilling at present is impacting on demand and delivery of service. Say something here. Um, we supported that wholeheartedly because we were limping along as such, and you were getting police officers coming in off the street, etc., who weren't really fully trained. So rather than assisting the PCSOs, it was a bit of a hindrance because they were having to teach or show as you went along. So we viewed that a chunk of officers, the 62, would be better to come in for stability because then they would then be the permanent until such times as we could fill these posts. But reorganisation is taking place at the same time now, so we're kind of caught up with going forward, and we've still got shortages here and there. We're hearing of shifts being varied because of it, staff being moved, because there's not enough resilience, etc. So we're kind of in, in the middle, if you could, like. Could you explain what you mean by reorganisation? Right, there's going to be a new structure um, with the hubs, 
Right, I, I think you, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. questioned Mr McEwen the last time mm -hmm. on that about the hubs. So we're looking to increase staff, get staff brought in, etc. cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And we hope there's going to be enough resilience in there because really what we should be aiming for is self-sufficiency going forward instead of having to keep taking officers off the street to help us backfill. Mm. So we're kind of, yeah, we're, we're left with this legacy of shortness, which we're trying to manage, but we're also trying to, to go forward as well. Yeah. But, but at the heart yeah. of my question really is the impact on frontline policing. Yeah. 60 officers backfilling. Yeah. Would um, either Mr Steele or Mr <coughs> McEwen like to comment on that? Is it the principle of moving forward is, as Lucille talks about, I mean, if I can just give just some high level indicators of what the what the force are doing around my criminal justice services division. So the policy now is that all vacancies are filled from April 2017. So that's been ongoing for a year. The, we are currently in the process of recruiting 70 new criminal justice PCSO staff. So 70 new people externally are coming into my division and we hope to have 45 of them in place by July of this year. So that's a massive investment that the force executive have uh, brought forward. Capital expenditure, I've been given in excess of a million pounds to spend on on looking at our estate and seeing new and innovative ways in which we can reduce the risk for the custodies but prevent frontline officers coming in. So an example of that would be in the four criminal justice hubs that I spoke about last time in Aberdeen, Inverness, uh, Falkirk and London Road, we're putting in place new CCTV. So we're putting CCTV in every police cell in those four estates. And what that then means is local police officers that currently have to either sit and watch a custody who's perhaps suicidal face to face or one camera. We have every camera with CCTV in it. And what that will do is enable less local policing officers to watch more cameras and to keep more people safe. The NCS, so we are the first division to roll out a national system in Police Scotland successfully. The Can I stop you there? My question was, what impact is the backfilling having on frontline services? The impact, for, from my perspective and from local commanders, is positive because what's happening routinely, previously it was, as I said, Mr Finney, who's a police officer in Group 1 in Aberdeen, would be backfilling one day, then a different officer the next day, and their inquiries that they're actually meant to be doing out in the front line are being impeded because they're getting brought into custody. So a permanency of police officers coming in then negates and there's no requirement for them to, or somebody else to fulfil their daily So, so it's inquiries. an adverse effect? I, I think there's been significant yeah. benefits, and that's the feedback that I've been a getting positive. from local policing. Positive, so yeah. They're being taken out of frontline um, duty to, to do custody duty, and that's a positive? Yeah, because previously they were getting taken out on a more ad, ad hoc basis, and there was more of them being taken out. So there is 62 now, whereas previously over the years, I'm talking three, four years ago, you'd be well into the hundreds that would be but coming out Forgive me, aren't filling. you saying it's not as bad as it used to be? It's certainly a lot better, yes. But there's still an adverse effect. The... That may be your perspective. I think during I'm asking this, you. no, I think no there's adverse been, effect. Whatsoever. I think there's a real benefit to policing and to the custodies and to continuity itself. And Mr. Steele, and then that's that's my finished agreement. Yeah, thanks. And again, through yourself, convener, counterintuitively, uh, perhaps, Ms. Mitchell, it is actually better that we have had the resilience put into the custody rather than face the considerable delays albeit there are still delays on occasions, that were being experienced by dealing with, uh, by coming up against a very under-resourced custody area. So counterintuitively, the removal of 62 officers to support the custody element of it has provided a, an improvement to the service that is experienced by police officers when they get to custody. Of course, self-evidently, the other side of that coin is that there are 62 fewer people out there to deliver the policing service. But in the round, the fact that th those that are utilising the custody service in their own right do not experience delays of the same magnitude and the disparate approach that was evident before these 60-odd were brought in to shore up the capability within custody, it is counterintuitively, or it certainly was counterintuitively, providing a better service. So, the, so you know, as illogical as it seems... I, I think we're looking at this as part of frontline duty, but I was talking about actually people out in the street dealing with things as they come along and separating that from the process. I understand yeah. there's a connection. Yeah. 
Thank you, Convener. Thank you. The last point of a mayor. I mean that is that this is an interim <laughs> solution. So the, the 62 police officers that are in and have been in for about nine months now will be returned by November of this year because we are recruiting these additional criminal justice PCSOs. So this is a, an interim solution, as Callum describes it, to shore up. The, the current state of the division until we establish the, the new and the innovative ways of working and then the officers will be released back to the front line. It is having a negative effect, without a doubt. Um, we now have PCSOs working on their own when really there should be two of them because the SOPs say two to go to the cells, two to take people for an interview, etc., etc. And that has been raised recently by myself to be told that risk assessments are now happening. So you're finding that staff are working on their own where probably there would have been two of them before. We're, we're having situations where, I was at Dalkeith speaking to custody just on Saturday, and one chap's moved away to another station, I think it was Livingston, and then they had to get somebody to backfill his post at Dalkeith, and of course that has to come from the street. So yes, you're right, it is definitely still having, an, is, is it better than it was? Yeah, but we're still having to backfill. It's still Thank having you. a negative effect. That's very helpful. Yeah. Ms. Inglis, I'm grateful for you mentioning risk assessment. A, a question for you, Mr McEwen, before I know Daniel wants to come in with a supplementary. People would imagine the decisions that have been made around deployment in uh, the custody area, which is a very important area, a lot of issues, they would be informed by, call it what you will, a work road analysis, a skills profile, and as has importantly been said, their risk assessment. Are you able to share any of these documents with, with the committee? Um, have there been occasions when assessments that have been made, as we've heard, you know, two members of staff do something, have not been uh, adhered to? We have, uh, we have a full policy around care and welfare. The, a lot of the risk assessments, I think, that Lucille are talking, is talking about are dynamic, uh, so they're, they're the staff on the ground. Could, sorry, can I interrupt you? Can you explain? I, I don't like the word dynamic. It seems to me that it's, it's a make it up as we go along was my experience of dynamic assessments. Um, how dynamic does it become if you... You know, if you have a, the, a, an input of custodies and a, a reduced number of people looking after them. So, so I, when I does the assessment then get made? So I disagree with you there. I think dynamic risk assessment is about empowering my staff at the front line, and I think that's really important to empower them to, to be able to make decisions rather than what's written on a, on a guidance. But we have a, a minimum set of resourcing principles. So, you know, and this is where it becomes very, very not confusing, but difficult to put it on paper. But my resourcing principle is one member of staff to 10 cells. So across the country, in some buildings, you have up to 50 cells, so you can work out the sort of maths for that. But the reality is you might have some, like Gala Shields has three cells, but we obviously don't leave one member of staff in there, we'll leave two. So a set of resourcing principles are there, but that's why it's important. You know, Some custodies can be very high risk, some can be low risk, some can be suicidal, some can be compliant. So. It really is for the staff on the ground to make a dynamic risk assessment about whether it requires two people to walk that custody from, from me to you, or if he or she is totally compliant. If one member of staff could do that, so that's what I mean by dynamic risk assessment. Well, well no one's taking away discretion, but are you saying that uh, um, in the scheme of the, the police service, relatively junior members of staff are empowered to say, I'm not going to do that, I don't think it's safe, it doesn't meet the terms of the, the risk assessment, people don't have the necessary skills profile? I would, uh, absolutely, I mean, that, and, you know, it's not, well, there, there are some junior members of staff, but it's staff from from <coughs> five months service to, to 25 years that are doing this, so, yeah, I would empower them all to, to, to come forward with new ideas and to make uh, decisions and use their discretion, absolutely. And and, and you're able to share with us any um, skills assessment, skills profile, um, and indeed risk assessment regarding? Uh, I'm not clear exactly what you're asking for, but I'll happily provide whatever you, so, you know, we, there's a three week training course now for our new staff that are coming in. So the 70 new members of staff that are coming in, there's a, a three week training course for them. It's very comprehensive. So I can give you access to what the training program is, if that's what you're after. So if a police officer coming in off of the street now to assist in custody, takes a three week training program, to make it safe. Was it safe if they were coming in on an ad hoc basis, just a, a day here, a day Sorry, there? Sorry, you misinterpret me. It's the new criminal justice PCSOs, so the new police staff that we're recruiting are undertaking a, 
a three-week training course because what we're trying to do with the new hubs that I spoke about is create an omnicompetent job description where the, the custody staff don't just do custody roles. They do case management, they do PNC, they do CHS, they do production. So we're, we're really building and enhancing their skill set and enabling them to do more than one area of business to uh, stop the silo working. And, and the ad hoc arrangements were safe? Well, the ad hoc arrangements currently have been mitigated because of the 62, as I mentioned earlier, where we've no, got but that were they safe, Mr McEwen? When? Well, if you had untrained police officers going into it. We don't have untrained police officers. The, the police officers are trained in custody. There may, and I do mean by real exception, if there is a, you know, a, a real uh, set of extenuating circumstances where we either need a police officer in there and there are none trained across the, the local area, then my decision would be we put that police officer in rather than have nobody. But my policy and my uh, guidance is that the officers should be trained. And in the main, and I'm talking 99% of the time, they are. Thank you. Um, Daniel? I'd like to put one supplementary question to the Seal Ingalls and to, to, to Calum Seal. My, my, so my understanding is these 60 police officers have been put in as a medium-term backfill in lieu of 70 civilian, uh, well, PCSO staff that are coming in. Now, the Seal Ingle said that the situation at, the, at present was better, but still not what it needs to be. Will it be what it needs to be when these 70 PCSOs are trained and in place? I'd, I'd be interested in your, your view on, on that and, indeed, Karen Steele. No, not in my opinion. And the risk assessments, um, it's good that they do risk assessments, but... We don't have crystal balls. You start off in custody and everything could be quiet, so somebody might deem, you know, we can work with just the one PCSO. But it just needs something to happen, somebody to go off, etc. It's a high-risk area. And, and personally, I would prefer to see more than somebody working on their own. I don't think it's good practice. Thank you. I, I largely concur with Lucille. Um, the 60 or 60 or 62 police officers uh, were in themselves a shortfall of the original request or certainly the original indications that came from ACC and Watson. He was looking for 100 to shore up uh, the capabilities within the unit. Uh, so that 60 in its own right was, you know, I mean, it was better than none, uh, but it wasn't as good as 100. Uh, so re replacing those 60 with slightly more to still not give you what the original shortfall was, was perceived to have been. And of but of course, you know, as, is, as I think everybody recognised, custody is a moving feast. The Criminal Justice Act, uh, for reasons that we may or may not get onto later, has resulted in a, in a reduction in the number of people coming into custody. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are, I think some people take views that there are legitimate reasons for that, and that we no longer need to take so many into custody. I know that certainly a significant number of my members believe it's a bureaucratic nightmare trying to take someone into custody. So that creates a, 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 an impediment in its own right to, to stop people getting in. And of course, there's the question of how long they have to wait to get back out on the street once they get to the custody mm -hmm. facility. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have some uh, examples that would make it here, Carl, of us, yes. uh, those of you that are fortunate enough to have some, uh, <laughs> of, the, uh, of the kind of things that have happened when, uh, when we await uh, t uh, entry into the custody facility yeah. because of the delay that the criminal justice staff are experiencing because of the obligations of the new Act. So, so just briefly, I mean, the ceiling goes, would, would you sort of concur with that implied shortfall of, of, of 30 FTE? Yes, yeah. yes, the idea was, <coughs> excuse me, the idea was for 100 but the child to, to get the, the relief from local policing, etc. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if, if I may, I think this is, the, this is probably a really useful point that Mr Johnson's touched on here, and uh, I, I think it highlights the, uh, a perception that exists across the police service, that when you need a problem filled, the place you go to fill that problem is what is, will broadly be termed frontline response policing. Uh, and areas of the police service, and I'm not saying that those that work in those other areas of police service are not performing gainful uh, jobs or uh, delivering important functions, but the more corporate and support functions and specialised functions are rarely called upon to provide the support uh, to other areas of policing when it's required, and it's usually the diminution uh, in what the, f the front line would, would, uh, uh, would deliver. Uh, and I suppose to some extent, um, you know, if, if I... Uh, may revisit uh, Ms Mitchell's uh, question, uh, had the police service drawn from a greater area of policing to provide these 62 police officers, then the effect on the front line, on the front line service would have been greatly diminished uh, whilst also enhancing the capabilities within the custody area. 
So, so can I just probe you on that point? Are you, are you saying that, that the, the, those officers could have been drawn from other uh, areas of policing or other areas of civilian staff could be retrained and redeployed? Uh, uh, which category of personnel well, well, are you I, I, about? I wouldn't dare to assume to speak for um, uh, pol police staff, um, okay. members of the police service, uh, not least because there are a huge number of complexities associated with contractual arrangements that would have to be uh, worked through. And police officers are inherently, through good or bad, uh, inherently more flexible Understood. deployment resources. Uh, but the police service generally lacks imagination when it comes to looking to finding uh, resources to move from one place to the other. Could, I, could anybody just answer that as well? Um, ACC Mawson did ask right across the board to the specialised um, squads, areas, etc. But unfortunately, it was lacking, so it did fall to local policing. Mm. But he did ask across the board everybody to look to see if they could release. Yeah, so I've been you. trying to come in to clarify that point. So 62 officers have come from local policing. Uh, we have 10 or 11 now from corporate services division. So what would be defined as back office? I, you know, I think they absolutely do play a valuable role in training officers and new recruits, etc. But there's 10 or 11 posts coming from them. And the, the staff that work within the corporate services organisational uh, development structures are actively looking to source more resource to bring back into my division. It does take a bit of time to achieve that, but you know we are definitely trying to to modernise our approach around keeping as many officers on the front line and taking staff from other areas to support frontline business, of which custody is certainly one. Okay, thank you. Rona. Thank you for being there. Uh, good afternoon, panel. Um, we heard previously about the number of prisoners being transferred over long distances um, due to lack of capacity within the custody estate. So could I ask you to update us on that? And also, um, if you can just tell us what assessments are made in order to make sure that prisoners, uh, vulnerable prisoners, um, are able to undertake such journeys. So the if you recall the last time, the, the significant change has been the introduction of the new Criminal Justice Act that we, we spoke about on the, the 25th of January. So my at the last session, I gave an indication, albeit not having a crystal ball, that I, I suspect the custody numbers would reduce again because Lord Carlewy's presumption of liberation, Article 5, around liberty of people and uh, risk managing people within communities rather than keeping them in a, a two metre by four metre box for two days until they appear at court. So over the 10 weeks before the Act came in to the 10 weeks after, there has been a further 15% reduction in the number of custodies that are getting kept in uh, custody centres across the country. What does that mean in numbers is over that 10 week period, there's 2,600 less custodies that have come into the custody centres uh, the 10 weeks before to the 10 weeks after. So I, I expect as the the Act further embeds and officers and staff uh, are aware of the Lord Advocate's guidelines and the presumption of liberation, that number will reduce. So to put that in perspective, in 2013, there was 202,000 custodies coming into my centres. At April, just you know, a month past, 31st of March, there was 130. So there's been there's been 70,000 year-on-year less custodies, and that's why it's important and difficult to, to keep looking back around numbers and, and staffing profiles because, you know, we've reduced by 72,000 people. So it's absolutely right as a, as a leader and as my staff and the, you know, right from the grassroots, we need to redefine what the custody model looks like because demand is plummeting. So it would be folly of me to to have custody centres open across the country with very limited custody custodies going through them, whilst members of staff are are in effect employed there and not not being as busy as they, they could be. So that's not really best value and not best use of the public purse, in my view. So has it reduced then the number of long distance journeys that were happening previously? And it has. Has it, has it helped the, the capacity? Of it the has. And I could just, I did, so I got a dip sample. Uh, I'll have to find my particular page around this. If you bear with me. Figures, figures, yep. So if you recall at the last justice uh, committee I gave, four weekends and I've done a comparison of 2013 to 2017 so and these are these are from 
paper records in the 2013, but national custody system now. But so in the first, so four, four weekends, which is when the transfers happen, they don't happen during the week, they happen at weekends. Four years ago, there were 79 transfers of a weekend. 2017, there were 17. And in February, for the first weekend, there was five. So we've went from 79 transfers four years ago to five in that first weekend. The second weekend, there was no transfers. The third weekend, there was four transfers. And the fourth weekend, there was 23 transfers, which really sounds quite high. So clearly, I looked into that, and that was because, because of... Uh, some pre-planned work in Livingston and uh, unplanned work. There was a flood in another custody centre. You know, our business continuity dictates that we need to then move uh, custodies about because of estate issues. But so we've moved from 79 down to five. We weekend two zero and four. So they are very very minimal transfers. Do require still to happen because somebody might get locked up in a warrant in Glasgow, but the warrant might be for Aberdeen. So you can't realistically expect that individual to spend a day in Glasgow and then be ferried up to Aberdeen two hours before a, a court appearance. So what we do is try and plan that journey to enable the, the custody to be transported at the quietest time for us and for local policing, but to make sure he or she gets there at the appropriate time. And there was also the issue of enhanced levels of care. Some prisoners were being transferred because there wasn't the facility or adequate facility of, of, of where they were. And I'm just wondering, you know, how that's panning out if the custody centres are not adequately, adequately equipped and how does that tie in with people who need extra care and vulnerable people and how, how are they assessed? Yep, so you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it makes no sense to me to have someone uh, locked up in WIC who has acute health care needs uh, or Fort William or wherever, because what that means, if that individual is likely to spend three days in custody from a Friday to a Monday, what that means is that police officers are getting taken off the street to watch him or her for that period of time, whereas the the real health care treatment will happen in the big centres where we have nurses and doctors and or doctors permanently located. So if, if we know that a custody is going to be kept for court, then we make a decision uh, on a, a criteria, you know, a, a really strong criteria about the, their vulnerability, whether they're happy to do it, is their family being told, Did they, is the case being dealt with, do they have all their property, oh, the solicitor has he or she been notified. So all these things are, are addressed first and then the decision is made to, to move the custody. Mm -hmm. But it's because of their health care needs and it's about looking after them. These are real people. Mm -hmm. Do you call in anyone else to help with that assessment or do, you, do the police, do you keep it in-house or do you...? You know. uh, in, in some areas, I'm trying to think, uh, so no, I mean, so in the areas where we don't have care, healthcare professionals, the sergeant will, will look at the record, look at the vulnerability question set, may, there are arrangements in place in some of the rural areas where they'll phone the, the locum doctor and seek her or her view around whether this individual should be moved to a centre where there's 24 healthcare coverage and then if that's the right thing to do, we would do it. Okay, thank you. I wonder, Mr. Steele, do you have any comments on, on that particular issue? Because yes, I know sir, it's one uh, that was of concern. Yes, on, on, on both of them as it, as it goes. The, I mean, uh, Mr. McEwen is correct in terms of the, the weekend transfer where uh, the number of people who were in custody uh, being taken from one custody facility to another has, I mean, it's not quite gone off the end of a cliff, but it's certainly reduced significantly. But the issue of people being driven long distances to get into a custody facility in the first place still remains. Um, you know, so, for example, uh, and I, I, you know, I corresponded with uh, my representatives across the country in advance of coming here. Um, and you know, a, a simple example: uh, if we look at U Division, which covers the the, the, the southwest of, of Scotland, if, if air closes, then uh, you know, uh, custodies from Garvin are taken to Kilmarnock, which is you know, an hour and a half. Uh, and you know, that's just the getting there and the getting back. The other area which causes considerable concern, and this seems to be getting worse rather than better, is the amount of delay that they are experiencing when they get to a custody facility. Um, you know, one of the examples that I highlighted in the correspondence was of a, 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 you know, a three-hour delay in February from 
you know, the individual being in the back of our van to get, getting through the door. Uh, I have other examples which are uh, not quite as, as lengthy, but certainly those far from indicative of a useful, productive uh, use of, uh, of police resource. Um, an example from uh, another custody area where a prisoner was waiting for an inordinate length of time in the back of a van, and despite being handcuffed, that prisoner was able to set himself on fire. Uh, now, there's a whole series of uh, issues of concerns that uh, I have to say, but for the quick thinking and actions of the police officers, uh, uh, serious injury was prevented. Um, other example. Well, uh, generally, I, I, I think they're probably cumulative. We, we have the issue that they still are not properly resourced, which is first and foremost. Uh, there's the issue that there is additional uh, bureaucratic obligations placed upon uh, the duty officers as a consequence of the criminal justice uh, of the of the new uh, of, the, of the new obligations of the Criminal Justice Act, uh, and those things, those two primarily lead to uh, lead to the greatest degrees of concerns. And we've also had an example where. Um, uh, prisoners, uh, now you can argue whether it's through frustration or whether it's just through badness, uh, kicking off in the back of a van broke the perspex because perspex degrades over age, another indication of you know, another area of the police service which has got problems because of a lack of money where the fleet uh, is going backwards and the perspex security screen degrades. And so the perspex broke and the prisoner was left with a weapon. So the issues of, the issues of custody are they are in danger of being looked at in a tiny microcosm of, of, uh, of being reflective of whether there's a problem elsewhere in the system or not. Because having local policing officers waiting for long lengths of time uh, and having to deal with increasingly frustrated and um, irate prisoners, uh, something that I highlighted previously, or even prisoners waiting for three hours in the back of a, of a van, is not something that the police service should be proud of. Uh, it's, you know, it, it's not the fault of anybody other than the fact that the service doesn't have the resource to be able to uh, deal with the, the challenges that it's facing. Ben. Uh, just very quickly, th thank you, Convener. Uh, in terms of the correspondence that you, you said you undertook in advance of this meeting and, and the correspondence you received back around delay, was there evidence that that was a, an issue in uh, our big cities as, as, as well as other places? Yeah, yes, indeed. The, the specific example that I highlighted of three hours uh, was in our biggest city. Thank you. Yep, I'm happy to, to come back on the two scenarios. So, you know, the chap that uh, Callum said set himself on fire I am aware of that now and I've looked at that and I can give you a chronology. So, a uh, violent custody locked up in Grangemouth, searched by the police officers prior to going in the van, but this guy was extremely violent. Handcuffs to the rear, right thing to do, taken in the van to Falkirk. There was only one other prisoner getting booked in at that point, but because of the 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 violent approach of this, there's a holding area in Falkirk that's got CCTV, so normal procedure would be out the van, into the holding area, await for the, the custody that's getting book in, booked in to be dealt with. This, this chap was so violent, the decision by the local policing officers on the ground was, let's keep him in the van until that custody is clear. During that point, they saw him rummaging in his back pocket. He produced a, a lighter. He did not set fire to any clothing. He did not harm himself in any way. And the two officers removed the, the lighter from him. So there was an adverse incident supported. I've looked at the documentation, and that's exactly the chronology around that. So I think we need to be clear about the reasons behind it and actually to the extent. So nobody set themselves on fire. He did have a, a lighter in his back pocket that was taken by the officer. So really good work from them. In relation to the delays uh, in Glasgow, football match, four custodies. The, the delay actually, the three hour delay is from the point of arrest at the, the football ground to the point of release. That was the three hours. The actual booking in process took 16 minutes and it's all there on IT if the members want to see it. It took 16 minutes to book that custody in, but from the point of arrest at the football ground to point of release, release, not incarceration, release was just in excess of three hours. So the facts are there, and I'm happy to share the facts uh, should, the, should the committee want them in due course. I, I don't think, uh, Mr McEwen, anyone doubts Police Scotland's wish to treat humanely prisoners. We, we, we do seem to have a, a very peculiar position where we have two witnesses in front of us, both serving police officers. Uh, one's telling us someone set themselves on fire and someone else is saying that didn't happen. It, it, 
would seem strange that someone still had that and the, uh, you know, the means to do so in their possession if they'd been properly searched. But I'm presuming that's because they were so violent. Is that? Yeah, that's my understanding. I mean, you know, in in the real world, in the frontline policing, these officers, you know, this this chap is extremely violent. They can the police officers do the best they can in these circumstances to to search that individual. You can't strip search somebody out in the you know, out in the sort of daylight, that would be done, you know, a full strip search would be done in the custody environment. So the officers did what they what they could, but this chap had a, a lighter secreted wherever it was, he had access to it. He tried, he didn't injure himself, he didn't set his clothes on fire, and you know, some some very positive action from the officers actually. The the only thing I've got to add to that convenience is I've actually spoken to the officers involved. Okay, doke. Well, uh, I think a bit of an impasse there. Um, Liam, uh, please. Yeah, some of this has been covered through, through Rona Mackay's uh, question, but maybe just uh, worth exploring a little further. In terms of, um, I think it's reference to long distances, I think, um, uh, Council, you refer to um, uh, excessive distances. I'm, I'm just wondering whether there's a, a, a definition or more detail you can give around that. And also a bit of clarity, um, I think this is the <laughs> example you cited wasn't a, uh, a move from one custody, custody centre to another, uh, but was in reference to a custody centre um, that wasn't available and therefore the distance that was travelled was from a sort of point of arrest to, uh, to, to the nearest then uh, custody centre. So I'm just wondering whether the, the, the problem arises as much um, in terms of the first custody centre the prisoner's taken to, or whether it's a, a, an issue of, of, of transfers between custody centres. I, th I think it's both. Um, I mean, the, in terms of definition, it's very much going to be dependent on the local circumstances that prevail at the time. Uh, you know, what, what may seem an excessive distance um, for uh, a relatively, uh, I use the term advisedly, certainly a relatively quiet uh, rural area uh, to get to a custody facility might not necessarily seem excessive for uh, an exceptionally busy uh, urban area. Um, but the, 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 the issue of, uh, like I say, the, the issue of delay is, is multifaceted. It is not just the issue of the, the transfer time. It's what happens when they actually physically get to the uh, get to the get to the facility, and that's where some of the greatest areas of challenge seem to be presented. And if I may, uh, through yourself, convener, the SPF did highlight that we were concerned over the admi additional administrative burdens that were going to come uh, through the new Criminal Justice Act, and indeed highlighted them at, uh, if not this committee, its, uh, its sister body uh, some time ago, uh, although those uh, concerns seem to have fallen upon deaf ears. Um, so, you know, we, we do continue to have um, Th those concerns and those that I have corresponded with have indicated that the issue of delaying getting into custody is much more difficult, is much greater uh, than it was previously. And is that, fact, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you on that, Carl. I mean, um, both yourself and, and, and Mr McEwen have talked about the numbers coming into custody um, dropping significantly. So one would imagine that those being taken into custody may therefore present uh, more of a more of a challenge that the, the circumstances are, are likely to be more challenging or more complex circumstances um, and, and therefore would, would the expectation not be not to justify inordinate lengths of time but but but, but the, the, the process is likely to take a, a bit longer for those cust th those uh, th those cases which are being brought into into custody now uh, I can certainly understand the temptation to go out down that line of thinking uh, but those people were still there before. You know, it's not like we're bringing in different people into custody by and large. You know, it, it tends to be, you know, largely uh, a lot of repeat offenders. Uh, but but you would have been saying pres presumably before that it wasn't the case that there weren't instances um, prior to the uh, Criminal Justice Act coming into, into force where there weren't delays occurring. I mean, I, I'm not sure what the figures are, either as an average or the, the proportion that we're, we're, we're taking a long period of time, but I, I wouldn't imagine that those those delays um, didn't exist prior to the Criminal Justice Act coming in. They, 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 they did exist, but they didn't exist to the same extent. The, dim, the diminution of numbers has been more than offset by the increase in admi administrative burden created by the new Act. Uh, and uh, like, a, a, and it's interesting that you, you, you get to the issue of the number of custodies, because again, uh, as recently as uh, early this week, I had uh, representatives corresponding with me advising me that 
the, they are now in some parts of the country they're encouraged to make contact with the custody centre before they get there and officers are experiencing a discouragement in taking custodies to the custody centre in the first place where, or, or and in some instances have been directed elsewhere and I know that, uh, that, that, that there was one example that Mr McKeon and I have discussed about, and it's probably not going to be helpful to get into that uh, that today uh, but uh, you know if, if, if I if I may, may quote for the thing, the a correspondence I've got before me, officers are encouraged to phone ahead to check that there is space uh, and that there is no queue ahead of them. Then custody sergeants are taking the opp opportunity to tell cops not to bring bodies in, even for cases like an offensive weapon. So, you know, these kind of these kind of pressures that exist within the custody areas are creating these additional pressures out for officers in the street. And almost we have a situation where we have a retrospective. Ex well, we have an absolutely retrospective review of the decision to arrest, but it's almost as though the decision to arrest in the first place is being second-guessed by the custody officer who uh, has not been fully exposed, or certainly second-guessed by the custody centre uh, that has not been exposed in first-hand terms to the events that the police officers who decided to make the arrest in the first place were. Yeah. I, I'm going to bring Mr McEwen in in a second. I just want to um, see if I... Uh, understand this, this fully. The discussions that you're talking about that take place are going into the detail of um, the, the circumstances of, of, of any arrest. It's not simply that a conversation has been had with the custody unit. They're saying, um, we would really rather you didn't turn up with, um, with, with, with this potential custody and therefore a decision has then been taken to, um, to, to, to release under investigative Lub or whatever, and yeah. I mean, th th there may be a degree of uh, there may be a degree of truth in that, and I appreciate that there's always a uh, there's always a, a difficulty in receiving a, a third hand account from mm. somebody that wasn't there in the, in, 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 in the flesh at the time, and indeed Mr. McEwen's in the same position where he relies, uh, unfortunately, on uh, the content of forms, which may not necessarily be as accurate as the first hand account of officers that have de delivered narrations to me, and uh, I'm. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here, but I uh, offer the opportunity for any members of the committee to come to the meeting uh, of the Joint Central Committee, or indeed I can convene a meeting of the Joint Central Committee of the Scottish Police Federation, especially to uh, to host members of the committee, so you can hear firsthand from the police officers exactly what their experiences of custody are. Because I am I am telling you as honestly as I can just now that they are remarkably frustrated at how custody is performing as a function, not at the delivery of the service by those that are working very hard within it, and certainly no uh, slight of the professionalism of those that are, uh, whether they are police staff or police officers that are trying their damnness to deliver a, a, a first-class service in very trying circumstances. But the simple reality is, is that the area of policing is phenomenally under-resourced and it does carry considerable risk. Yeah. Could, could I maybe come in there? Of course, yeah. Um, I think what you've got to bear in mind as well is that some areas are working this one-to-one, -one, you've only got the one PCSO on. So that delays things. Um, also, if I use air as an example, um, they, they stick to the SOP and if they've got 10 prisoners, that's it. They, they say, no, we've not got staff to cope with it. So they then have to transfer them somewhere else. Um, so that must have a bearing and people do queue when you come into custody centres, without a doubt. And staffing has to be an issue in there. Mm -hmm. Now, to circumvent that, it adds, it has like a domino effect because um, at the weekend I found out that one PCSO, he'd travelled in a weekend 128 miles, and that was to cover other custody areas. But when he went, they had to backfill from the street, bring somebody in. Now, the person they brought in won't be as up to speed as that PCSO would have been had he remained there. So that everything has to have a knock-on effect. Transfers definitely are reduced not done away with altogether, but they're certainly reduced. You're not getting the horror stories where, you know, they were going from the east right through to the west, couldn't get in there, tried somewhere else, and then ended up coming all the way back and spent all night, really, travelling around the centre. So we're not hearing these stories, but we've now got people still being transferred, being reduced, but we're now moving PCSOs around to try and cover gaps elsewhere, and then you're backfilling those posts. 
with less experienced people. So it has to have an effect. And does it does it also include cases when we heard um, earlier, Mr McEwen, you, you referred to the example of where somebody may be arrested in, in Glasgow, but the, the case um, is likely to be heard in, in Aberdeen, and therefore the, the custody, it makes more sense for that to be in, in Aberdeen. Is the reverse happening there? If you've got air, for example, where they're saying we can't accept any more, and then you're going to get somebody who's, whose case is going to be heard there, being put into custody some way, some way distance, so it kind of undermines the the, the benefits of the, the 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 transfers that are being taken place elsewhere. Yeah. Right. Mr. McEwen, sorry. Yeah. So uh, a lot of a lot of points there that I'll certainly not attempt to capture. The Pyros form. So the new Criminal Justice Act. There is a, a new form, which is called the Pyros form, and there without question that legal requirement to fulfil that documentation does take longer than the previous section 14 etc documentation so it's a it's a eight or a nine page document it takes longer and the officers and police staff will, will take a bit of time to get to use that but you know this is where i and i don't mean to be frus uh, sounding frustrating but moving forward the, the plans that we have now in place and i touched on some of the the investment but one of the things that we're looking at around is iris recognition so some of the forces down south have it where a custody comes in they scan the eyeball and the it self-populates 90 percent of the form so their, their uh, booking in process times have reduced from about 40 minutes to nine minutes. So that's the things that we're exploring now to look at innovative ways to build into the criminal justice hubs that will actually reduce the, the, the delays and, and some of the, the waiting times. We are building new charge bars. We've bought, built one at uh, St. Leonard's already. We've built a, a holding centre in Inverness, which it used to be in Inverness that you would queue. We're now creating a holding centre with uh, CCTV, so the custodies are not queuing in the back of vehicles as they did four years ago and 14 years ago and 24 years ago before that. We're now creating a holding centre where they can sit, be monitored by CCTV in a more pleasant environment. So we are, we are trying to modernise in a very, very quick way now. You know, the final point, I know I'm conscious of time, but there's 70 criminal justice PCSOs coming in this year. My uh, proposal to the force executive, which they are considering for the year after, is a further 80 criminal justice PCSOs. So in totality, over two years, my preference is 150 new members of staff coming into this division. So the 62 police officers will be released back to the front line and we'll create a, a sustainable division that actually then begin to take work away from police officers. Because what happens currently, and it's happened for 30, 40, 50 years, is that police officers arrest the or detain the custody out in the street and then they embark upon their present throughout the booking in process, present through the photograph and fingerprinting, present through the solicitor access, the solicitor consultation and all that work in the custody environment takes three hours of local policing police officer time. I want to build a model where we take that from local policing and the local policing staff hand over the custody and they go right back out in the street. So that's the model we're trying to get to. That's the proposals that have been agreed by the force executive as recently as a fortnight ago. That's the direction of travel and we're just incrementally now trying to get there. But it's got a two year start to finish date and and an increased 150 new members of police staff with first line managers built in there. So we're looking to develop and enhance the skill set of our police staff as they come in to actually release more police officers back to the front line. Okay. Thank you. Stuart. Thank you. And before I ask my question, I just declare I have a close family member who's a police constable. Um, I think we've covered an awful lot about processing and so on and so forth. I think I'm only left with one very small thing. Um, and that relates to the Pyros form that's just been made reference to. Is that something that is in the public domain? And if it's not, could we see it? Uh, yes, I think it is in the public domain. It right. was part of the new Criminal Justice Act, but I could certainly get you a copy. Because I think that would kind of flesh out yeah. some, of, some of the things that have been said. Right, let me just raise a new issue that hasn't uh, been brought up. And of course, we're very limited in time. Uh, and this is really for Police Scotland. And that is just what's happening on the custody... Uh, a provision estate review, if there's anything you can give us uh, a, an update on uh, that, so Bri fairly briefly. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what you mean exactly by that, so... 
Uh, well, I, I, understand, I understand you're, you, you, you're looking at what you really need, particularly yes. in the light of reduction in numbers yep. uh, and other considerations. Uh, are, there, are there any matters related to that that haven't emerged in the previous evidence that we've taken? The, so we're looking to create four criminal justice hubs that I've spoken about in year one yep. in, in Aberdeen, Inverness, Falkirk and uh, London Road with increase in staff. Year two, we're looking to create another five criminal justice hubs. So we do all that work that local policing are currently doing that I spoke about and the, the five other key areas. So there'll be nine criminal justice hubs strategically located across the country that will deal with the vast majority of custodies that come in, not them all. We will then retain the, the current custody provision that we have. But as a consequence of the, the reduced numbers, we are currently looking at further estate rationalisation. Now, where that where that goes to, I'm not entirely sure yet because it's too soon after the act. I, you know, I've given the figures, but I want to leave it another few months just to get a, a true baseline about where our custody numbers are going to oh, be. Okay, that's fine. Let me just ask a very simple final question on this. Um, you said vast majority going to the hubs. What proportion of custodies is that? Approximately. Uh, I'd be, to be honest with you, I would, I would have to look at that. So well, you use the world's vast majority, yeah. so you've obviously got something in your mind. No, you'd be, you know, I would, I would say about 80% of custodies, but I don't, I would have to really look well, at the numbers. perhaps you could let us know after. Yeah, I could do that, certainly. Okay. Come here. Um, thank you, Stuart. Um, Daniel, you have some questions. I'd like to ask a, a couple of questions. I mean, it's clear from, from the, the broad sweep of the questions that we've been asking that, that much of the solution to easing the, the burdens is, is the delivery of the new criminal justice hubs and the, the bringing online of the new uh, omni-competent, and I have to say I love that uh, term. I, I, I was wondering if I could take some omni-competence training myself. Um, but but I, I, uh, I, I was, some, some caution has been expressed both by SPF and, and Unison about the timelines um, that are envisaged for the delivery of, of phase one of that programme. And I was just wondering if, again, uh, Lucille Ingalls and Clamsfield could maybe elaborate on that a little further. Is that simply about the training of those PCSOs? Or are there other concerns about the timing? And what, what are the, sort of the impacts of the, the, the delivery of the, 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 the other phases of that programme, given that phase one is just three of the, the um, uh, hubs, and, and given that the full programme is, is nine, and as, as I think Gary McEwen just set out? Yeah, um, we're certainly um, on board with the restructure, um, with the hubs, etc. Certainly, we've got a lot of butting of heads as yet over um, shift patterns, etc. That's a big thing. Um, the timing um, is going quickly, I have to say. Um, recruitment, there's still some vacancies there um, that we need to work around, and we're going to monitor it as we go along rather than just say, you know, the, the trials for a year or 18 months, we're going to keep monitoring it, so tweak it as we go if need be, or if it's not what we thought it was going to be, etc. So um, that's about as much um, as we're there. I mean, we've, we've got the recruitment in for the team leaders, which we welcome, and going forward, there should be no police officers in there per se. It should all be PCSOs that are caring for the welfare of the prisoners, which is a good thing from our point of view, that releases police officers back to the street. It's something that we are expert at. Um, you know, they're well trained for it. So that's where we are just now. The recruitment's being done. And I believe, is it going to start in July? It was to be June, July, yeah. I think, um, going forward, if, if we can agree a shift pattern. <laughs> The training is a challenge because it's a three-week training course, so we're trying to broaden broaden out the skill set to do a number of different things rather than just custody or rather than just case management or rather than just PNC and CHS. They're going to be trained in them all. It's a three-week shift pattern. Uh, sorry, a three-week uh, training program in July. The, the college are, are gearing up to train the initial 45 that are coming in July and then the following 25 later on the year. But it is a definite, you know, it's a big investment in staff, so it does take, it's a challenge for training and learning and development to, to build the programme, but the force are definitely prioritising it. Okay. Can I say, there's a wee bit um, apprehension, shall we say, around, you know, dealing with productions, dealing with warrants, um, etc., records that they're going to be doing. Um, initially, 
Um, we were concerned about the impact that would have on people on these departments already doing these jobs. However, we're assured that it's not to replace them, it's to help out. I personally think, um, maybe optimistic, I think they think there's more downtime than there actually is. But, but it'll be interesting to see as we go forward. Staff, um, some are quite happy because they see it as extending their role, um, giving them more initiative, etc. Others are wary, you know, what it's like for change. So, Can I just ask, in um, your view, I mean, it, it sounds like these people are going to be asked to do um, a huge amount of, of different things. It's, yeah. There's a huge responsibility. Is three weeks enough to train people adequately to do those range of roles and take that responsibility? It gives them the rudiments, the, the systems, if you like, the computer systems, etc. A lot of the training will be on job training, mentoring, buddying, um, that kind of thing. You know, you don't go away and then suddenly become a fully qualified PCSO and just slot into the workplace. You know, you get your basic training and that will be ongoing. Um, and, and just to come back to your, your previous mm. answer, you said you, you, you're going to sort of view it as, as you go along as to yeah. whether or not we're on track. I mean, are yeah. you... Are you confident that the, the, you know, the delivery timescales are going to be met for phase one? Confident, no. Right. Hopeful. You know, we won't, see, we won't know until we actually start it, to be honest. You know. I think Callum Steele's yeah. interested in coming in as well. Uh, I am, uh, specifically seeing you, you identified me to answer the question in the first place. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think, I, I think uh, the, the short answer is it very much depends on the, the appetite and hunger of the service to make it happen. I mean, it's... it's it's not quite Archimedes-esque, but if you give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum upon which to place it, we can move the world. Uh, well, the same is true of training and investment in getting people through. You know, if we want to train more people, we have more people in training to deliver the training. Uh, we tend to work to the lowest common denominator as to what can be accommodated by the people that we have, rather than looking to build the capacity. Uh, but I am, uh, I, I am, I'm not. Uh, overtly pessimistic, but I do think that the timescales are uh, very, uh, very optimistic. Um, insofar as uh, they may well deal with the resourcing requirements to deliver the service, but as far as we can see, there doesn't seem to be a great deal of uh, resilience built within those numbers. Uh, so the, the, you know, the likelihood of the criminal justice or the custody area being subject to absences, abstractions yeah. through, you know, training, illness, leave, and all the rest of it, uh, it looks to us as if this is on the very bare bones of having that kind of tolerance built within it, uh, which, because of how we know the service is responding to the financial constraints that are placed upon it, comes as no surprise to us whatsoever. So finally, uh, I mean, Gary McEwen, I was just wondering if you could uh, address some of those concerns that have been raised, and in particular, could you just confirm when you expect phase one to, to conclude, and indeed what, what you view the kind of the key risk factors in, in delivering to that, that date and how you're mitigating them? So, so the additional staff are coming in for the uh, beginning of July. There will then be a three-week training programme and then the staff will uh, be cascaded to the, the three hubs, the two in the north and the one in, here in central. The, the challenges that we are finding just now is the, the 45 posts, the majority of them have so it's staff already within the organisation that want these opportunities. So I think there's 35 of the 45 filled by current existing staff. But then, of course, we need to fill their job. So they're moving across to the new job, but we need to fill. So we're now externally advertising to fill these. So. I mean, there is a risk, you know, I said that at the, begin, at the beginning, there is a challenge around getting these staff in place because it is about who's interested in the job, when they can get released from their previous or their current position elsewhere in the in society, in the 28 days notice, etc, etc, etc. But all I can really do to reassure you is that it's on our risk register around getting the, getting the training in place and getting the resource in place and as an organisation, this is one of the number one priorities for the for the organisation is to get these staff in and get them trained and get them in the hubs because the benefits to local policing and releasing staff back by doing that three hours of work, the, the sooner we can get that delivered, the more officers there are out in the street responding to calls and, and dealing with, with local community issues. And just critically, when do you think it will conclude? So we're well, we're looking to have the staff in place by July, the 45 in place by July, and then the following 25 in place by January of 2018. 
and then we're going to have to monitor the success or otherwise because this is a you know this is a totally new concept that we're looking to build that, that we think is really innovative really future proofing what criminal justice services division needs to look like but we need to really evaluate it and i would welcome coming back here in due course to to give the committee that opportunity to scrutinize it Daniel, I, I wonder on that point, Mr McEwen, would it be possible to give us a, a, an update both on the training and deployment um, at, at, key, at key points? Because yeah, the, 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 the committee does maintain a, a keen interest in the important issue of custody. Um, I have one final question, and it relates to um, a, a, a suggestion um, which fits with my thinking on how policing should be. Everything is, should be as local as, as possible. It's a suggestion from the Scottish Police Federation that day-to-day -day control of custody um, um, provision could be given to local divisional commanders. It would seem to be a, a, a key function. I'm not trying to do you out a, a job personally, Mr McEwen, <coughs> but um, would there be any problem with that? Collaborative working has always happened across the service, and would that uh, not be a very clear signal of the importance about... To, to, to me, it, if, if I'm being honest, I was a local commander before mm. coming into the National. Uh, I don't think... I think the benefits around quality control, the ability to flex resource across divisional boundaries, which happens now. You know, Lucille mentioned that uh, PCSOs are getting, you know, now that's a, too far a travelling distance, 100 and whatever round trip. But if, if we return back to 13 different divisional uh, custody programmes, I think the ability to flex resource will not happen. The HMI's view on it is that the national custody system is the right structure. The new Criminal Justice Act that has come in talks about operational independence. So what they say is that the, the custody function, the, the reviews, the ability to justify and, and warrant the, the arrest of individuals should be independent from the operational policing. My fear would be if but we... That can happen at the moment with policing and a range of issues of operational independence. It's someone detached from the initial... So if, if they work together... In my, so going back <coughs> 10 years ago... What happened was you would have one sergeant that would have overview of both custody and operational policing. That's that's the the model that we we moved from over the last sort of decade. My fear would be we would we would return to that, and that would be against the essence of the new Criminal Justice Act. Okay, Mr. Steele. Yeah, I, uh, it, it's certainly a suggestion that uh, comes up very regularly amongst my. Uh, my representatives. And of course, there is a world of difference between having operational independence and keeping something separate from operational policing. Uh, and I think that there is a danger in conflating the two. Um, I think to some extent the, the idea or the merits further examination uh, because it's much the same way as policing has evolved over the last number of years. It does seem rather um, uh, rather counterintuitive to, as a, you know, to use the same word that I used at the beginning uh, to suggest that policing would not be able to adapt its practices uh, to ensure that that operational independence could be uh, maintained and not just revert back to the bad old practice of days gone by where uh, undoubtedly custody care was not as good as it is now. And, you know, I, th I think if I'm looking for a, a positive note upon which to finish, uh, the one thing I will say is that the custody care when in custody uh, is head and shoulders above what it was previously. But I don't believe that that is necessarily um, uh, something that is entirely dependent on having a separate custody division to, to enable that to happen. Uh, proper training, proper accountability and proper reporting lines should be capable of delivering it. Because once upon a time, that's what the police service was perfectly able to do. Thank you. Um, Ms. Ingalls. Yes, I think the expertise lies within custody, to be quite honest. I think it would be a mistake to go back to, to local policing been in charge of that. Okay. The very, very final point uh, is that the, the nine criminal justice hubs, clearly there's 13 divisions, so there's nine hubs, so they're going to cross divisional boundaries. To me, we need to establish the criminal justice hubs then, you know, have them established, and then I think a debate in two years' time around whether certain elements of the function was to return. I think that's the time to have the debate. I think we need to get the nine hubs in place. And if we cascade it back to 13 division at this point, I'd be surprised if it ever happened because uh, it just would not be as streamlined as hopefully it will be. OK, thank you for that. Margaret, you've brief yeah, clarification. Just one bit of clarification. You said there were 72,000 less individuals in custody. Um, over what period? So each year. So, year, so annually. So, yeah, so in 13-14, there was 202,000. 
1718, there was 130,000. Right. In two years' time, we'll be closing our custody centres. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Any further questions, committee? Okay, can I thank uh, Mr McHugh and Mr Steele and Ms Ingalls very much indeed for your very detailed responses. That's much appreciated. Thank you. We now move into private session. <laughs>